Oh, um, I just wanted to say thank you all for coming to see the demo. This is going to be a demo on raw food, but also on a way to start incorporating a little bit of healthy cooked food into a raw food diet. Uh, I'll give you a little bit of my background. I started with raw food probably about eight, nine years ago, and I had watched a TV show. And the chef on this TV show was on PBS, and she always did vegan food. And her food was wonderful. And one day she decided to do a raw dish. And I remember watching her make it and thinking, wow, that j it just resonated with me that you would take food in its purest form and eat it. And that way you're getting the most nutrients from it. And this chef had done uh, zucchini noodles with a tomato sauce. And so I made it for my daughters. And we were all vegetarian at the time. We weren't vegan. I made the, the zucchini noodles, I made the tomato sauce, and we ate it. It was the worst thing we'd ever had in our life. <laughs> I mean, it was awful. I, can, I know now why it was awful, because the acidity hadn't been balanced out in the recipe. And so it basically was this super acidic tomato saucy kind of thing. It just didn't have enough elements in it to balance it and make it taste really well and be pleasing to the palate. But what it did was it really sparked an interest for me in raw food. And I started thinking, you know, I really want to figure this thing out. So I bought every single raw food cookbook that was available at the time, which back then was a lot less than there is now. Um, and I started making all the recipes. And then all of a sudden I decided, you know, I think I can start creating some of my own recipes. And so I started, I, ha I had a background in, in um, you know, French cooking. I am a sommelier. So I have a lot of, I had a lot of experience with food and working with a lot of very well-known chefs. So I decided, you know, I'm going to just start doing my own thing here. And I started doing my recipes, and the recipes started working out, and they were great. And I decided to start my website, which is raw amazing. How many of you are familiar with the website? Oh, we've got a few of you in here. That's awesome. It's beautiful. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> well, it's, and the website took off like crazy. And so the website gets over half a million hits a month from all over the world. And I've written five cookbooks now, and I've also... Um, done some studying. I have T. Colin Campbell's plant-based nutrition certification, and I also have a vegan chef certification from Ruby, which is an, the top online cooking school. So that's a little bit of my background. Um, with my raw food journey, where I got to and where I am now, in the beginning, I was 100% raw. I mean, and that's usually what happens when you find out about raw food. You get so excited and you start eating 100% raw. And then you get maybe four months in, six months in, whatever. And I was living in Minnesota at the time, and we hit winter. No. <laughs> and I remember it was 30 below. And 30 below is really cold. It's like you walk out the door, you try to take a breath, and your lungs hurt. I mean, it's hard to even breathe. And so... Looking at the raw food, now remember this is eight years ago or you know, six years ago, trying to maintain a raw food diet at that time started getting really difficult with all the cold weather. And so what I started doing was I started eating a lot more fat. I started adding tons of nuts and tons of coconut oil and I started eating the foods that were a lot fattier and a lot of dehydrated foods. And I didn't feel so good. And, but it helped my cravings and it helped satisfy that need for the calories. But it wasn't, I didn't feel good because I was eating too much fat, too much dehydrated, it's, you know. Yeah, so you just, it, it just gets bad. Um, forward ahead, I started realizing that if you just start adding, if, if you try not to be, or you don't have to be 100% raw. If you start incorporating really healthy, and I mean healthy, I'm not talking about deep fried cooked food, I am not talking about you know, grilled cooked food, but I'm talking about vegan food that's in its purest form because we always work with unprocessed food. I mean, I always like to take everything, you know, I mean, when we use corn, we use corn. <laughs> you know? And I even, I even try to avoid canned tomatoes. But you know, once you start processing, that's when you really start running into trouble. But when you start taking food, a small amount of cooked food and adding it to your raw food diet, a lot of times what that'll do is it'll satiate that need for those extra calories. And plus, you're getting some darn good food, too. Um, in the raw food community, there are times when people, they kind of want to make you feel, and, and this is, please, this is my opinion. I mean, there are going to be people who have a different opinion than I do. But a lot of times, they want to make you feel like if you eat anything cooked, you're going to completely sabotage your raw food diet. But the truth is, is that there are actually 
good things about cooked foods. I mean, beans, which we're going to use today as our cooked element, one of the healthiest things that you can eat. I mean, their fiber and the nutrients and all the wonderful things that are in beans. Why would you want to completely eliminate that from your diet, especially when it has great protein and it, it fills you up? You know, so for me, I want to have that in my diet. Um, there are also cooked foods that give you, you can get more nutrients after they're cooked than you can get from them in their raw form. Now, on the flip side, there are raw foods that you get much more nutrients from the raw version than you do from the cooked food. So to me, you balance it. You know, you kind of cover all your bases. And that's sort of where I come from because I want you to be able to eat really healthy but have more options, you know, so that's, that's where I come from. So anyway, today, what I'm going to do, I should ask if there's any questions before I start cooking. What about all the talk about uh, raw foods being hard to digest for some people? They are hard to digest for some people. That's not, you know, everybody, there, there's something called bioindividuality. So everybody's system is different. My system is different than your system. You know, I was doing a talk once for the University of Minnesota. And, you know, all the Norwegians in Minnesota. I am not Norwegian. I am not <laughs> Scandinavian. And I remember I pulled a gal out of the audience, and she was about six feet tall, about this thin. And I stood her next to me, and I said, do we look like we? <laughs> you know? I mean, we're all different. Every single person in this room is different. Your body is going to like different things. And so, yeah, you, there are people who are going to have more trouble digesting things that are raw. But you have to figure out what works for you. And there are certain raw foods that are going to be a lot more digestible. Um, than other raw foods. So that's, that's, a, you know, that's a valid concern. For me, I like to tell people, figure out what works for you. You know, experiment with things. See what makes you feel the best. And when you get to the point, you, you can fine tune your own diet. You know, you don't have to be dogmatic about anything. You've got to figure out what works for your body. And that, to me, is the best way to go. So, okay, and so today, what we're going to be, any other questions before I get into the demo? Okay, today I'm doing what I kind of call an unrecipe recipe. And basically, the reason why is because you can do just about anything you want with this recipe. And so I'm going to give you kind of a guideline and show you how I throw it together. And there's also, we have the recipe cards that you can look at too. But, you know, when you're making this, feel free to do what you want to do with it. Feel free to put what you want in. And you can take it anywhere from, we're going to use black beans today, and this is my cooked element. Mm -hmm. But you can also, you could saute an onion and throw it in there also. You could, you could saute the tomatoes or the corn. Did you have a question? Susan, do you pressure cook your beans? No, I actually don't. I soak them overnight, okay. and then I just cook them on the stove. So I have a really beautiful black bean pot that I like. But, <laughs> but I will tell you, I do cook my beans. I don't like canned beans. And, <laughs> um, you know, because you're dealing with, you're dealing with things that whatever is in the can that could be leaching into the beans. And plus, they just don't have the same flavor. And the beans that we cooked or that I cooked for the samples that you're going to be getting, we actually, or I cooked them al dente. So they're a little, there's a little bit more tooth to them, but they're fresher. And then you don't know if they've been soaked, what people have done before they cook them. Exactly, exactly. You could be getting salt, you can be getting all kinds of things. Plus, if you want to talk about flavor, the flavor when you cook your own beans is, I think, a hundred times better than anything you can get out of a can. After you soak it overnight, mm -hmm. do you use the same thing quickly cooking? No, I don't. I don't. You rinse it and yes, I do. You know, it depends on the beans, but it usually maybe an hour to an hour and a half. Yeah, it doesn't take long. If you do a good soaking on your beans, your beans are going to release some chemicals that make them a little <laughs> undigestible, and so you don't want to use that soaking water. I mean, I know there are people out there that say, oh, they're going to taste really good if you cook them in the soaking water. I'm not going to tell you that. I'm going to tell you, get rid of that soaking water and put new water into, the, into your beans and then cook them. you make black beans salt? I boil for two hours and I soak it. I It's just you cook it longer. If you want to get them soft, you just cook them longer. <laughs> well, and that's kind of why I like them a little with a little tooth, like I said, with a little al dente. So there's a little crunch in there. But they're not crunchy, but they are just a little firmer. I mean, I have, I, I, believe me, I have boiled black beans until they're nothing but mush. <laughs> but I don't, you know, I'm not fond of that. So anyway, so today, like I was saying, our cooked element is going to be the black beans. And I'm going to start you off, I think, I think we'll start off with the beans and what we do with those. What's that? 
slow cook the beans? Right, you bring it to a boil and then you reduce the heat and then you simmer for whatever amount of time it takes to get them done, which usually is about an hour and a half. And it, you know, different beans are going to be different time periods. With a pressure cooker, you need only 10 minutes. Oh, no, I know, but I, this is how I like to do it. So I'm happy with this. I mean, and you certainly can use a pressure cooker. You know, everybody uses their own thing. So I'm going to start with what we have on the recipe. If, I don't know, do you guys have the recipe if you want to follow along? Yeah, but we're just going to put some black beans in. <laughs> and this is what I'm saying. This is how I'm saying that this is a recipe that you can really do anything. If you want it to be, have more corn in it, put more corn in it. If you want more tomatoes in it, put more tomatoes in it. So we start with our beans. And then I like to just dice up a couple of tomatoes and throw those in there. Now, one other way that you can do this, if you put it stovetop, you can actually, like I said, saute an onion over a medium heat and then add, oh, you know what I forgot? I forgot my scooper. My little. You can use your hand. <laughs> <laughs> we won't judge you. No, you guys are eating the stuff that we cooked in. <laughs> so this is, oh, Shannon, can you? Yes. Thank you. Uh, two is fine for now. So then we have the, we want to do our tomatoes real quick. Mm -hmm. Now, if I'm going to do these tomatoes in a pan, or actually, if I was going to throw this tomato and I wanted to cook the tomatoes with this instead of doing the tomatoes raw, what I would do is I would, I would dip these in boiling water, I would peel them, I'd push the seeds out, and then I'd dice them up and throw them in the fry pan. Does that make sense? Yeah. But that's if you want to cook. If you want to keep it raw, you can just go ahead and chop them up and throw them on in there. So I'm just going to chop these up. Can you guys see all of this? This too? OK. Oh, no, I know. I just want to make sure we're, <laughs> we're oriented correctly. And then um, corn. And I would get organic corn to make sure that you're not getting genetically modified corn. But you can find it around. So no GMOs. Yeah, we're not happy with GMOs. So I'm just going to take this corn off the ear real quick. The beans themselves are very simple. There's not a lot to it. And that's another nice thing about this recipe is you can really throw it together fast. You'll see how fast this one goes together. Okay. So the corn is going in. We've got the tomatoes and the corn. Susan, how long do you keep your beans after you cook them? How long do I keep them? You know, if I'm not going to eat them within a day or two, I freeze them, yeah. which is another thing you can do. If you want to cook your beans in advance, go ahead and cook them and freeze them. And then you have, you have beans on, on hand. There's also a method that you can do for a quick soak, it's called. Have you heard of the quick soak? Where you, bring, you put your beans in a pot, put an inch or two of water over them, you bring them to a boil, you let them boil for one minute, and then you turn the heat off, and then you let them sit for an hour, and then you go cook them as you normally would, and that's considered a quick soak. So if you forget and you run out of time, which I never do, <laughs> then you can do the quick soak. Okay, so here we have our corn going in. And then I like the flavor of sun-dried tomatoes. I think it gives a nice pop and a nice, you know, nice little bit of depth to this. So I can't get it open. <laughs> <laughs> so you're going to slice up a few sun-dried tomatoes. If they're dry and they're hard, definitely soak them. Yes, absolutely. To get um, the ones that are soaked in oil, you know, they're pretty good too. But they're oil, and so if you're trying to be oil-free, obviously you don't want to use those. So, so we're going to throw in some sun-dried tomatoes. And I'm going to just stir this up a little bit. And then I love to hit this up with a little bit of spice. I'm going to need a paper towel. Paper towel. Yeah, because this is kind of how I do my... <laughs> so I have... Um, Chipotle powder going in, and smoked paprika is going in. So we're going to put a little bit of that in, too. Thank you, dear. Okay. Then we just mix that all up. 
Did I leave out anything? <laughs> Did we forget anything? <laughs> I don't know. No, it's been a while since I've actually done a live demo, so it's kind of fun to be back. <laughs> So then here's your base, here's your bean base. And how fast was that to throw together? Easy. Really super easy and very flavorful. You can also hit this with a little bit of salt. And what I use, I, and I use almost exclusively Himalayan sea salt, or pink Himalayan salt, because of its purity and the fact that it actually does have minerals in here. And the flavor is fantastic. So. I even carry Himalayan salt with me. <laughs> and if you want, you can throw a little pepper in. But you really, I mean, that's completely up to you. What makes Himalayan salt better than, like, you know, regular salt? Well, your regular table salt has been processed. And it's been processed with all kinds of chemicals. It's been bleached. It's been, it goes through all this. And there's no nutrition left in it at all. Pink Himalayan salt is mined out of, from an ancient sea that used to be up high. <laughs> so... And it, all, it has a ton of minerals intact. And the, like I said, the flavor is fantastic. It tastes there, completely different. Is there a difference between um, grinding it fresh or getting it um, pre-ground? That's probably a good question. When you get it pre-ground, it's going to be finer. And I tend to like a little bit of a coarser salt. And I like less salt. So if you have a coarser salt, you use less of it, you're going to get a pop of flavor mm -hmm. without having to over-salt everything. And so that, you know, that's a good way to use your salt. Um, okay, so now we're going to throw together, where's our towels? We're going to throw together the salsa real quick. And I'm going to do a really quick demonstration of this because I literally could be here for a little while cutting. <laughs> um, one of the things that I love to do when I create recipes is I love to start with one ingredient and then figure out what's going to marry to this ingredient. You know, what types of food does this ingredient like? Because lots, there's a, a book, I don't know if you guys are familiar with it, there's the Vegetarian Food Bible and the, or the, and the Flavor Bible. They have it both vegetarian and regular. And it is a fantastic book to have because you can look up an ingredient, you can say like, oh, I've got eggplant in my refrigerator, what should I do with it? You go look up eggplant and all of a sudden you'll see all of the things that eggplant loves to hang out with. And if you start using your foods that way, things are going to taste really good, especially if you're doing your own recipes. Because you don't want to grab something that eggplant hates. <laughs> you know? And then all of a sudden you're going to take a bite of it and go, I don't like this. <laughs> so anyway, um, I don't even know why I was talking about that. <laughs> but OK, so the, the beans. Um, one of the things, when you look at this mixture, the black beans, the corn, the tomatoes, that wants something bright to pop it up a little bit because this is an earthier flavor, this is a little heavier, and we want to give it something nice and bright and flavorful to balance out the flavor of the beans and the corn. So I do this wonderful, it's a pineapple, avocado, mango salsa. And we can take that, and that goes on top, you guys will taste it. And then we're going to actually finish it off with a lime cream that's made with cashews. That's pretty fun, yeah. I don't even know where we're at with time, so. Anyway, so to make the salsa, basically it's just a bunch of dicing. You start with your mango, you wanna dice it up. And for salsas, you wanna keep your dice pretty fine. Um, I like about a quarter inch dice on my salsas. You can make it chunkier if you'd like, but this way, especially with this salsa, it's gonna have, a lot of the flavor. So we're gonna, basically what we're gonna do is we're just gonna dice up the mango. And then we're gonna put that in the bowl. And where is the pineapple? Oh, right <laughs> <laughs> and we pre-made we pre -made the pineapple. So, and you want to do the same thing with your pineapple. So all these flavors, the pineapple, the mango, they're nice and bright and they're lively and they're, they're going to make those beans just want to sing. So we're going to start putting the pineapple in. And then the avocado that we'll put in in just a second that brings in a really nice, 
It brings in a nice mouthfeel. It brings in a little fat. It brings in a little, it rounds it out and makes it a little bit more full. So we have our mango, we have our pineapple, and then we're going to put some red onion in. And in salsas, I really, really like red onion. It has a nice flavor to it. It's a little stronger than some onions, but it's a good onion to eat. Flavor-wise, it's good raw. So we're going to get this peeled up. I should have you do this, Shannon. <laughs> yeah. I did a demonstration once. I was teaching a class in Minnesota, and I started cutting an onion. And it was such a strong onion that I got, I, I teared up so bad I couldn't even see. <laughs> was, I had to take a couple minutes just to kind of get myself back under control. But this one shouldn't be so bad. One quick way that you can cut an onion, you come in and you slice it. Did you see how I did that? You sliced it the horizontal. Then you come in vertical. Just watch your fingers. And then if you want to keep your dice nice and small, just take really nice small sections of this, and then you've got almost a perfect dice. Can you see that? How nice that is? Super easy way to cut an onion. So we're going to throw some of the... Do you know what we have for time? Time? Yeah. So then we put the onion in. I should have had a catch bowl. And then, okay, and then our avocado. I could probably slow down. <laughs> If you have any questions while I'm doing this, please just raise your hand. I'm more than happy to answer them. Um, picking avocados. You always want to get one that yields a little bit to the touch, but isn't really soft, because you're going to get some of that happening. So these two are a little bit ripe, but we're going to use them anyway. Um, the way I take pits out of avocado is I just grab it with a knife. You guys probably all know about this little technique. And then there's two things you can do. You can either, if you're careful, you don't want to cut through and cut your finger, you can actually dice them right in the, the shell. And then just pop it all out, and you've got your nice diced avocado. Or another way that you can do your avocados. I need a sink. <laughs> yeah, you do. <laughs> you guys forgot the sink. <laughs> Um, another way you can do avocado is you actually can, the skin peels off super easy. And so you can peel off the skin, and then you can just go ahead in and slice this way. And take another right down the middle, like that. And then once again, we want to just, and then another nice, beautifully sliced avocado. So two different ways that you can do your avocados. So now we have the avocado, we have the pineapple, we have the onions, and we got to give it a little heat because we're going in a southwest direction here. <laughs> so I'm going to put some diced jalapeno in there. Now when you're working with jalapenos, if you're sensitive, you might want to wear gloves. One of the things that you want to be careful with is to not get the seeds and the membrane is where all the heat is stored. So the heat isn't actually in here so much. It's more in the seeds, mostly the membrane too. So what I like to try to do is I like to try to scoop that out. Hmm. The white part. I'm going to take this out. And a lot of times, you know, there have been times when I've been cooking very fast and I, I grab this with my, and all of a sudden, an hour later, my, under my thumb is burning <laughs> because I tried to scoop it out. Yeah. Oh, yeah, exactly. You rub your eye or, you know. So this is the part where all your heat is. I don't know if that helps. Oh, thank you. And this is going to be more the part where your flavor is. There's still going to be some heat in here, but not, not anywhere near as much in the membrane. And I, I know for a long time, I think a lot of people thought that it was in the seeds. It's not so much the seeds. It's really that white membrane that we have. So the membrane, yeah, is the white part. Did you guys all get that? You, can you see this? The one that I pulled out of there? 
So then basically, you just come in and you want a nice fine dice on these. So you're going to give a, you're going to slice it lengthwise, very fine. I think I'm maybe around an eighth of an inch here. And then just come in and slice away. So these end up being, can you see these? About an eighth of an inch cube? Okay. So that goes in. We'll do one more. Except, of course, I forgot to take the membrane out of this one. Don't let me touch my face. <laughs> yeah, really. No, no, exactly. That's the worst. <laughs> So we'll give a quick little cut to this one. I should talk about equipment a little bit too. Mm -hmm. um, for me, my two most important things in my kitchen are this yeah. and my little small paring knife. Yeah. Seriously. Mm -hmm. You can do almost anything you need to do if you have good knives. And you should, especially your chopping knife, yeah. make sure you get a really good quality knife and learn how to sharpen it. It's not hard. You can get a whetstone, because you always want a really nice, good, sharp knife. If your knife is dull, you can really hurt yourself. <laughs> it slips. It does, it slips. This is a Wusthof. Wusthof. Yeah, but there, I mean, and the other thing about knives, it's really interesting. I notice on my website, it's always interesting when somebody will ask, they'll ask me, well, what's your favorite dehydrator? Or what's your favorite knife? And my answer to that always is, you have to figure out which one feels best to you. And so people are so anxious to jump on and say, oh, I have the Excalibur and it's the best. And well, it might work in their kitchen, but if you're dealing with those space limitations or you want something that's super, super quiet, that might not be the right dehydrator for you. You have to figure out what your needs are. With knives, you go and try them out. Go to, um, you can go to Williams Sonoma. They always have something around for you to cut with because you want to find a knife that balances in your hand really well. And for some reason, this one works very nicely for me, but my hands are not huge. And so I like the grip on this. I like the way it feels. I like the balance of the knife. So you have to find a knife that when you cut with it, it's going to feel good in your hand, you know, not somebody else's hand who thinks that whatever their knife is is the best. Because there's a lot of really, really top knives. The big important thing is that you have a good quality knife and you keep it really sharp. So that's, my, that's one of my equipment lectures for you. <laughs> Okay, so now the last thing we have to put in the salsa is lime juice. And of course I don't have a fork either. <laughs> so basically you're just going to add lime juice to this. What do you think about ceramic knives? I don't like them. Oh. And it's just a personal opinion because they're really light. Oh. And so, I mean, for certain things I guess, and, and I know there are people out there that say that for some reason they degrade the food less because this, something about the ceramic... But I can't imagine it's going to be that much that if you don't like cutting with it. But for me, it's, it's not my knife. Somebody else might love them. Does anybody here use ceramic knives? Do you love them? Yeah. <laughs> they do break if you drop them. Yeah. And they chip. But there are people who absolutely swear by them. And if you love them, then use them. I mean, that's the best thing about this whole thing. So now we have, we've got, you guys aren't eating this one, don't worry. <laughs> so now we have our beautiful salsa that we've put together. And if you want, you can always hit that with a little tiny bit of salt. You probably don't need pepper, but if you like pepper, you can. I, another thing I always use is fresh ground pepper. I never use pepper just that's already been ground because the fresh ground has so much more flavor. And what you're trying to do is you're trying to delight your taste buds. You know, you're trying to put something in your mouth and, and when you put it in your mouth, your mouth goes, yeah, you know, I really like this. And so to do that, even the choice of your salt and the choice of your pepper can make a huge difference in what you're making because it just brings that flavor out. Instead of it being more dead, it's more alive. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, so that's our salsa. I wonder how they're doing on the samples. Uh, there's lots. Okay. Do they usually pass the samples out during or after? 
Okay. Well, yeah. we'll do the we'll do the the cream, and then we'll be the we'll be all good. Yeah. Okay. So now the last thing we're gonna do is a little cashew cream. How many are you guys? Are, is everybody here vegetarian or half vegetarian? Or so are you guys? Or how about vegan? Have, oh, yay! <laughs> that makes me so happy. <laughs> That's awesome. No judgment if you're not. <laughs> but it really makes me happy. I mean, not only for you, but for the planet, for, you know, why we're all here. Um, cashews in vegan cooking are like the holy grail. <laughs> because you can do almost anything with them. They have a beautiful texture after they've been soaked and you blend them, they get so creamy and nice, they have a little sweetness to them, but they don't have an overwhelming flavor. And so we'd love to use them for almost any dairy substitute that you want to do. You can do creams, whipped creams, you can do, um, you know, we do, yeah, sauces, cheesecakes. I mean, we make cheeses out of them. We do all kinds of things with cashews. If you have an issue with cashews, if you can't eat cashews, two nuts that you can substitute, and I say that, you know, generally, macadamia nuts and pine nuts will work for cashews so um, but they don't work as well as cashews so we're gonna make a lime cream to go on top of this um, we're composing a meal and my my wonderful new husband we just got married last week <laughs> it's the first time I've introduced him as my husband how fun is that <laughs> But anyway, when we first started dating, actually, he was a pretty big meat eater. And, um, <laughs> but it wasn't, it was partially because of my cooking and my influence. I think it was when I took the T. Colin Campbell's nutrition course that, you know, that they teach through Cornell that we both just, I mean, especially Peter, it just hit him that this was really the way to eat if you want to be healthy. And so Peter's now been 100% vegan for about two years. But when we first started dating, I remember teaching him about what I would call a composed bite. Does anybody know what a composed bite is, Peter? <laughs> yeah, when you add all the different elements together, it's all the parts that make the whole. And, you know, there was a, there was a thing that we used to say in, in wine when I was doing my sommelier work. You know, one plus one, if it's a beautiful pairing, and this goes for food too, one plus one doesn't equal two. One plus one equals five. Mm -hmm. You know, if you do a bad pairing or put foods together that don't like to be together, one plus one can equal negative 10, you know. So, so what we want to do, what we're doing here is we're, we're creating a composed bite for you with the black beans, which are hearty and earthy, the salsa, which is bright and really flavorful, lots of pops of flavor. And then we're going to put the, oh, do we want, do you need that under here? Under or are we okay over there? <laughs> okay. And then the lime cream, which is going to add a little bit more richness and mouthfeel to what we're doing. Plus, it'll have that nice lime taste. And it's got a little sweetness to it, which offsets the spiciness and the saltiness. So that's kind of the idea of what we're doing. But to make, um, to make a cream out of cashews is super, super simple. Basically, you soak your cashews because you want... an. A high-speed high blender helps, but if you just have a regular blender, just make sure they're soaked all the way through so they're nice and soft. You don't want to have any dryness on the inside. So you put your cashews, and I'm using actually this little Vitamix that I have here. I should show this to you real quick because it's one of my favorite things that I use in my kitchen. I have a really large Vitamix too, you know, the big pro Vitamix, mm -hmm. but when you put small amounts in the big Vitamix. Have you guys ever done this? And it's hard to mix them, right? What's the, what is that? You explain that to me. Yeah. <laughs> Peter's an engineer. <laughs> so he explained it to me. But Vitamix is, and I'm not, I'm not selling for Vitamix. Well, I, I am a Vitamix affiliate on the site. But right now, I just want to tell you about this really cool blender. They came out with this smaller blender. And so if I'm doing any kind of a cream sauce that only requires maybe a cup of nuts, I love this because it just does a beautiful job of blending them. It is. Yeah. <laughs> it is because, you know, you're sitting there fighting with your big one and saying, why can't, you know, and then this one just will whip them right up. Does it have the same strength as the bigger ones if you want to just make a single portion of a smoothie? Or Absolutely. Yeah. It really yeah. does. It just is amazing. It's a, an amazing blender. What is it called? 
Vitamix? It's just their small one. I don't even. Yeah. Yeah. If you go and the this is this is small too though. So if you go to the site, I'm not even sure. Yeah. Yeah. So let her dry. What's that? Oh well, talk to the Vitamix people if they're here. <laughs> but I'm I'm I love this because I can just grab it real quick. I can throw it on the counter. I love having the small base to it. It's just it's 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 their person. I think it's kind of what they call their personal blender, and it also comes with um, one of those deals where you can just do a smoothie right in here and walk off and go. Yeah, exactly. Only with like a billion times more power. <laughs> I wouldn't call it a travel blender. It's, it's still pretty heavy. Unless you're taking your yak. <laughs> so to make a basic cashew cream, you soak your cashews, put them in your blender. And I'm not even going to worry about measurements right now. If you bring your water up until you just cover the nuts, you're going to get a pretty nice cream just from that right there. If you want it thicker for cheeses, you're not going to add as much water. But you can also follow recipes. <laughs> and then we just take it. You can see we're getting a beautiful, nice, smooth cream. Can you guys all see that? Yeah. See how it's, yeah, very simple. So now in this one, I want to get a really good lime flavor in here. So there's two things I'm going to do. I'm going to get the lime juice out of my limes, but I'm also going to zest my limes. And when I zest, I always use a microplane. Everybody know? We're all familiar? Yes. I, put a, I did a post once of a, a raw lemon cheesecake. And you can get a ton of zest off of a lime mm -hmm. when you use a microplane. It's so much flavor. It yeah. is. And it's wonderful. It's easy. You get this beautiful zest. Very, very simple to do. And I think somebody was using, like, the, you remember the little zesters mm -hmm. that have the little holes in them? Oh. <laughs> and they said, it took me 20 lemons to... <laughs> I was like, no, two. <laughs> So anyway, we're going to get some of the zest off the lime to put in there because we really want to get that lime flavor. And be careful not to get into the pith or the white part because that's when it starts getting bitter. And it's also not good for you. So, Do we? <laughs> this is actually, I should introduce Shannon. Shannon Marie, she's my assistant. And she helps with the website. <laughs> And she gets to taste recipes, and, and she's just a wonderful human being. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> she is. Anybody that knows Shannon, you just think about unicorns and sunbeams. <laughs> she's delightful. So we have a nice little pile of zest here that we're going to use. I'm going to go ahead. I wish I had a fork because I would show you one of my favorite ways of juicing. But since I don't, basically what you do is you just stick a fork in and then you squeeze it as you move the, and you'll, oh, do we have a fork? No forks? No fork? They don't trust us with pronged instruments. <laughs> no forks. Okay, so anyway, we'll pretend, okay? So, but then you can just go like this with the fork and it will get all the juice out of the lime or the lemon, or the orange, whatever you're doing. And the, I remember the first time I saw somebody do that, it was a... Do you include the seeds? What's that? Do you include the seeds? There's no seeds in here. Oh. <laughs> but no, I would not include the seeds. Absolutely not. Lemons, you're going to get seeds. Because the vitamins would chew them up. But still, they're bitter. They're bitter. They're bitter. Yeah, and so you don't want that bitter flavor in what you're in. I mean, I could throw a whole lime in and it would chew it up. But it would be better. You know, we'd have the pit. <coughs> But since I don't have any seeds in these limes, so I'm going to put a bunch of the lime juice in. Thank you. And I will tell you this, too, about your zest. Are we doing time? Um, you want to add that at the very end, and I'm going to show you how I do it. Okay, so, okay. I don't know how late we go until. 
Okay. <laughs> we're doing pretty good. <laughs> we'll have a 10 minute question. <laughs> so we're going to put the lime juice in. That's a lot of lime. It's very limey, huh? It is, but you want to, I mean, <gasps> to taste. I love citrus. I love lemon. I love <laughs> lime. And the cashews, because they're sweet, they're going to counteract the lime a little bit. They're going to counteract that tartness. Um, you know, another thing on how food goes together. And so basically, you need a lot of lime juice in here. It does not hurt. Oh, no. Not at all. Don't have to worry about that. So then you go ahead, and we're just going to mix that in. And what I like to say, to taste. I mean, always do it to taste. And start on the small side, because you can always add. You can't take out. <laughs> I mean, there are things you can do, but you end up kind of mucking up your recipe. So we've put the lime juice in now. We have this beautiful, mm -hmm. and at the very end, we're going to pulse in the zest. Because if you put the zest in too early, especially with the Vitamix, you're just going to pulverize and it's going to disappear. So at this point, I'm going to put in my zest. Excuse me, Susan, are you going to put sweetener in this one? Oh, I am. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Um, actually, I add, and I'll, I can do this right now, too. Um, I'm just going to put a little tiny bit of maple syrup in here. And you don't necessarily need it. And you're going to watch me put maple syrup in, and then you're going to watch me put salt in. But think salted caramels. Yes. <laughs> you know? So just a little tiny bit of maple syrup in here. It does. It balances it, and it deepens the flavor. I mean, what we're looking for are lots of layers. We want lots of layers to our flavor because then it, it really makes it deep, and it makes it rich and, you know, just really fulfilling. So we'll put that in. We'll do a couple of pulses. You can, at this point, you could even stir this in by hand if you wanted to. Yeah. And you can even add salt and pepper to this if you want to just give it a little kick and you know mix up the flavor a little bit it works really really well so I'm going to throw a little tiny bit of salt in I need that bowl <laughs> and a little bit of pepper yes do I, oh you know what here we'll just do this one if you can dump that water for me and I'm even going to go in I'll just mix this up a little bit so what, what, uh, what do you use this for besides this recipe this blender yeah. no that that uh, oh, cashew? Yeah, what else do you use it for? Everything. I mean, like what we were talking about, you can make cheeses, you can make, um, you can make whipped cream creams, you can and make, sauce. yeah, sauces, all kinds of, I mean, ice cream, exactly. <laughs> Cashews, I mean, it is probably our number one, one of our number one dairy substitutes. Yes, absolutely. You know, like there's some creamy dressings. Yeah. In, in fact, on the website, there was a long time that I was using a lot of olive oil, and we use cold pressed olive oil, but I was, you know, I'd use it in my dressings, I'd be making vinaigrettes. I have really walked away from using oil, and I'm trying to use, I, I haven't walked away from fat. I still like having some fat in my food. I think it's good for your hair. <laughs> Obviously, if you have a heart condition, you want to think about, you know, think about that in a different context. But the fats I like to use now are natural fats, you know, so a lot of times I will use cashews to make a creamy dressing instead of doing, you know, the old vinaigrette where you're using half olive oil or whatever. But, um, yeah, you can use them in dressings. They're just incredibly <coughs> versatile. And if you go to the site, the site is on the, the recipe page. It's rawamazing.com again, for those of you who might not have heard. You can just look up cashews, and you'll, a ton of recipes will come up. You know, we make cheesecakes with them. We make all kinds of wonderful things. So anyway, but I would, I'm also going to tell you that when I use nuts, I do use them sparingly. I don't like to do, like if I'm going to do an Alfredo sauce, I will use maybe a quarter of a cup of cashews, but I'll also use tofu. And now obviously tofu isn't raw, but then, then once again, that can be a cooked element for you. Because, go ahead. So do you always have cashews soaking? I don't always have them... <laughs> No, I don't always have them soaking, but I do always have them on hand. I mean, that is an absolute staple in my pantry. I have gotten pretty good. I mean, having done this for over eight years, I've gotten pretty good about, okay, I think I'm going to make this in a couple of days. I'm going to start soaking some cashews. The other thing you can do is you can soak them, and then you can freeze them. 
you know, once again, I mean, use your freezers. Freezing food does not degrade it that much. You know, way much, I mean, way less than canning or, you know, a lot of the other things you can do. So if you're in a pinch, freeze stuff. Do you have to soak it Before you freeze it? Yeah. Oh, I'm just saying if you wanted to have them on hand. Because then all you have to do is pull them out of the freezer, defrost them, and then you've got soaked cashews. You don't have to wait your six hours, you know, to soak your cashews. Right, exactly. <laughs> and another great thing that I love to do in the freezer is, you know, we drink green drinks every single morning. We have our big green drinks, you know, smoothie. And a lot of times, so we have lots of greens in the house. I mean, tons of greens, pounds of greens. <laughs> and as you know, greens will go bad on you, you know. And when they're just starting to get to that point where you're looking at them going, eh, throw them in the freezer. And then you can use those frozen greens in your green drinks. You can make ice cubes now. You could, mm-hmm. But yeah, just throw them in the freezer, freeze them, and then when you're going to make a green drink, just pull those out. Or if you run out of greens, then you've got, you know, stuff. I love the freezer. <laughs> so, so here's our sauce. Your soaked uh, nuts in the refrigerator? What's that? Instead of the I do soak, when I soak the nuts, I do soak them in the refrigerator. And I usually put them in overnight. Um, I'll probably, just before I go to bed, I'll throw the nuts in the water mm -hmm. and then put it all in the freezer. Yeah, I think this is a good time for this. Okay. Samples can set So here's our cream. So you can see the cream. And then uh, you, if you change the water when you're soaking your nuts, you can keep them for four or five days. But just make sure you change out the water or they're going to get a little funky on you. So now the way that we would plate this, and I'm going to, here we go. You can leave them soaked for four or five days. Just make sure you're changing the water, okay? And they'll stay good. So the way I would plate this then, this is the main, I made a mess. <laughs> this is your main element. So here's your, here's your salad. And like I said, if you wanted to do this, the beans in a fry pan and make them hot, if you want something more like a comfort meal, then go ahead and throw them in the, the fry pan, heat them up over a low heat, and then add the other ingredients in. And after we do the beans, then we're going to take a little bit of the salsa and put that on top. And then you'd finish it off with just a dollop of the cashew cream. There you go. So any other questions? I wanted to know whether you wash all your food before you cut into them. Absolutely. Always. Except, yeah. I mean, here I'm not going to because, you know, I mean, I did wash things at home too, but you're not eating this food, so. When you soak your black beans overnight, do you soak it in the fridge also or just in You know, my beans I just leave on the counter. Any other? Onions, this one has a little bit of saute. Yes, the tomatoes went in at the very end, uh -huh. so they really didn't see a lot of heat. Mm -hmm. But you can, that, would, that was what I was talking about when I was saying you can do almost anything with this recipe. Yeah. You could make it almost 100% raw, just the beans would be your only cooked thing. Or you could saute the tomatoes in there. You could even saute the corn. You could saute onions in there. Yeah. You, know? you can take it to any level you want. Yeah. You can sprout legumes. Um, I sprout lentils all the time, and I love them. I am not sure that you can sprout beans. I think that there are chemicals in beans that you should not be eating. It's actually toxic to your system. So, although I do eat chickpeas once in a while, I'll pop a couple soaked ones in. But what's that? Yeah. Okay. I, I just know that beans, there are certain beans that if you eat them raw, they're very toxic. Yeah. Yeah, mung beans you could sprout. So there are certain ones. And lentils, exactly. Yeah, I said lentils. But do your research. I mean, look it up. Because sometimes when we're trying to be raw, sometimes we get a little too carried away. And we could do things that might be damaging to our systems, too. What other nuts can you use? 
drink so easily? You could do, well, almonds are a little gritty. Almonds tend to not break down as well, and they're a little more on the bitter side. So macadamia nuts for the, for the creams, for the cashew creams. Yeah, macadamia nuts and pine nuts actually work quite well. Brazil nuts work well, but you have to be careful with selenium overload with Brazil nuts. You don't want to eat too many Brazil nuts. No, not at all. Well, I mean, I don't have less. I do have I noticed a difference. I eat less fat food because I get this, I get satiated here. So, anyone else? How do you guys like it? Delicious. Okay.